journey. I've been asked to talk to you about the uh, future of creativity. And let me be frank, it's not the first time I've been asked to talk about something I don't know anything about. <laughs> so when I started, I had the good fortune to be um, the assistant to a great landscape photographer called Faye Godwin in the UK. Some of you may have heard of her. She's not very well known. Um, so my background then is that basically I made prints and landscapes. She got me my first two jobs to illustrate a walking guide. And I thought I'd love to do landscape photography. And then I realised that actually I'm really bad at in the mornings. And if you can't be a landscape photographer if you're not, if you're not going to chase the dawns. Uh, so I had to adjust my ambitions. So this is all black and white work. This is all fine. Um, the writer prints. Then I, I did a wonderful journey. I drove uh, from London to Beijing uh, along parts of the Silk Road and photograph on the way. Uh, we even made holograms on the way. Um, so here are just a few pictures. That, that, that the ones that actually is quite interesting, I thought I was going to take lots of pictures of buildings and, and art and uh, landscapes, but actually what really caught my attention, what really got my, my passion, uh, were the wonderful people that we met. The key thing for me is, is that when I was teaching at university, the technicians brought me over and said, here Tom, have a look at this. And here was a list of all the new digital cameras that had come out that month. And somehow I had that insight. A graph came to my head, into my head and I saw one line coming down and I saw one line going up. And anyone who's been watching stock markets, any accountants or, or anyone, knows that that crossover point is a crucial, literally crucial point. The fall was the numbers of film cameras that were on the market. And the rise was the number of digital cameras that was coming on the market. And we had reached that cross, crossover point. So there was action time. And I remember saying to the technicians, I said, boys, do you know what this means? It means that we've just entered the age of digital photography. And that was the time when all my other colleagues thought, Tom, you're an idiot. You know, these, they're only like three million megapixels. I mean, the, the, the image quality is so pathetic. It's worse than some of the real high-speed colour films that were on the market. And the underlying thought behind that was it's never going to get better. Right? <clears throat> and of course we hear echoes of that today. Um, but I adopted it, I, ad I adapted to it, I... You know, in those days, we, the computers would crash four or five times and they'd need complete reboot. If you wanted to plug something in, you had to turn the whole system, had to turn the whole system off, plug them in, and then if it didn't work, you'd have to change the order in which you plug them in. All of that, all right, which you're now completely saved from. So anyway, so, so we got through that. So these are pictures from my travels. Um, to illustrate those 40-year-old books. You've got little kids kind of going, ch -ch -ch -ch, just check the, the, the bolt action on their, on their rifles. In the, this is an open market in somewhere in um, Oman, I can't remember now. Now I want to introduce uh, this series, and I, I'll whip quickly through them and then go back. And I want to ask you what you think is the common element in the picture-making 
process. I think that's the last one. Is that the last one? Yeah, I think that's the last one. No, nope, that's the last one. So, any any thoughts as to what the common element is? is it low down, right angle? They're all low down. They're not all low down. No, 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 no. no, no. A couple of which are quite. Hi, like the one in the palm. That's not low down. Any other thoughts? Wide, wide. wide yeah, yep, yeah, they're all very wide, yep, yeah, correct, yep. Yeah. Quite a lot of depth of field. Yeah, lots of depth of field. I'll tell you the story of this and then you you'll get it. I wanted this kind of low down shot. And I thought the ground is muddy, it's covered with those orange um, fruit things. Um, which are delicious, by the way, make a good jam. Um, but I didn't want it on all of my trousers. So what did I do? I turned my camera upside down and I put it on the ground. The result, quite frankly, was a complete and total surprise. All right, it's what I will refer to later as a kind of layer two creative moment. Uh, that what I realised was that actually I hadn't seen what was in the camera because I couldn't look at the... I just pointed and thought, all right, click, and it worked. So basically, all of the other shots that are here were not framed. I, was not, I did not look through the viewfinder. All right. That's why the rule of thirds went down the drain, see. <laughs> <coughs> all right. They're all unframed. And when I kind of started to query it, and I thought, I can't, this is, I can't do this. <laughs> I can't just poke and, and hope for the best. Um, I then started to try to frame, and I found that my hit rate dropped. That the really interesting shots didn't, come back. And when I look at, I mean, obviously, you know, I've, I've made lots of shots and, and varied the angle a bit. But what I was doing was I was varying angle and then I didn't like shoot for every half degree rotation. I would fiddle it around until it, it felt like this is, I'll try this. I found that my hit rate was as good not looking through the viewfinder as it was with other kinds of framed pictures. Right? It needs, I think, a certain frame of mind, certain kind of sensitivity. Um, and after a while, I started to see that, for example, I couldn't actually see um, what was on this, on, on this car because it meant that actually, because <laughs> the car was like this and I put the camera like, I don't know, on the bonnet to try to catch the reflection. Because I knew the reflection would be better close to the reflective surface than away from it. And I have to say, once I did that in New York, and it's only when I was doing that that I realized actually the driver was <laughs> in the car. I mean, it's a dangerous thing to do in New York, but I got away with it. Um, so anyway, so. What does this show you? Um, I don't know whether it shows anything, but for me, it showed me that all the things I had learned about precision framing, about never cropping, they had, a, they had their place, but there are other ways of doing stuff. All right, this is right on the ground with the waves coming in. So I wasn't gonna lie down for that. <clears throat> and this, this came and went. You know what? You know what these bush, the bush light is like. The sun only needs to move half a millimeter across the sky, and the light's gone. 
and this I had specifically to be careful not to frame through the viewfinder. This is Abu Dhabi, this is in a mosque. <coughs> Photography is allowed, um, but you better not make it very evident that you're photographing women. And it worked perfectly. I was astounded. <coughs> now, so here's another uh, series. All right, we're in slightly intelligence, it's obvious. They're way overexposed, overexposed. I don't know about you, but I love them. All right. They work in a very specific, very particular way. Um, and it was something else that I discovered by accident. I was photographing this little... Uh, church in, in Greece and I didn't realise my camera was dialed to one and a half stops overexposed. So I got all these pictures back and I thought, oh, heck, I'm an idiot. And I tried to correct them and I thought, no, 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 no. No, actually, actually there's something to them. So I started working on it. Right, so this is my colours of, of white um, sequence, I showed that in, in South Africa and um, I've developed it over the years. There is a you know, specific uh, recipe that you need to follow to make these work, um, but I love them. And what's for me very interesting is that I've not seen anybody who work in the same kind of way. And here's another one. We're in Bali. And anyone who's been to Bali knows that the Hindu love to put on these kanang, uh, no, kanang sari, uh, their little daily offerings, appreciating the gods for what they're giving to them. But because there are lots of tourists in Bali who don't look where their feet go, all these little off many of these little offerings get kicked. So I started paying attention to that, and I thought, ah, oh, this is, hmm, this is nice. These are basically accidental, they're, they're the products of life. They look like accidents, they look like chaos, they look like somebody who's been careless. But by paying attention, and I think this is a key element to this, by giving it the right attention, we can elevate this mess into a composition that, that, that tells us something about how we can, create, we can create beauty out of disorder. So, oops, sorry. And if you go on Google and you look for pictures of Hindu offerings or Kanang Sari or whatever, they're all perfect. And they're so boring. Right. So I have a big series and one of these days we're going to go back and I'm going to do more on this because I think they're, they're, they're beautiful. So in, in Bali we spent, I, we were there what, a week or so and I spent the whole time looking at the ground. I wasn't interested in monkeys and temples or anything. I was looking for these. And that led to this series of work. Because during lockdowns, we all had to figure out ways of working at home. So I started working with mess that derived from this Kanangsari. Uh, because I observed that if you have a 
um, a, a vase full of um, cut flowers. After a while, the petals form. And what we use it to do is kind of clear it up and clear out the mess. Um, but I don't believe in mess. Actually, I love my, my mess. I mean, I have certain parties are very critical of the mess that I live in, but in my studio. Um, but this mess creates art, if you like, once you give it a chance. So I would put my drawings with, with ink spatter or whatever under a vase of flowers and just wait for the petals to fall. And when it's done its thing, I would take it off and I'd photograph it as is or I would drop some other stuff on it. So this, this series was shown in uh, Onehonga. And I think that's what a lot of what art is about, is to open up the uh, viewer's imagination, to stimulate it, to make them think, you know, what it looks like and why are these strange juxtapositions and what are these um, conflicts of scale. So, yeah. Yeah, and these are bits, again, trimmings, which I've... I kind of just chucked on. Um, and they were on the light table as well, which is why there's some translucence coming through. So let's zip through this, and if it's going too fast, um, stop me, all right? So um, this is just a quick introduction into AI in photography. Now, I asked you about whether any of you use AI. The fact is, all of you use AI in yeah. some form or other in your photography. Exactly. Right? And you have been doing so since the mid-80s. Right? With, so this is Nikon FA. Um, quickly, I'll say, it's, it's got the main features of what today's AI has, except with different figures. Right? They, they analyze 30,000 um, transparencies. They divided... They classified the transparencies into five areas. They built what they call the decision tree, how you decide what the final exposure is going to be. And it's built into the camera. Right? And that was called intelligent metering. So what we have is an instance of weak AI. Specific, confined, doesn't learn, doesn't interact. Just does its job. So this is a list, a very incomplete list, of all the ways in which artificial intelligence of one form or another is used in photography now. All right, I won't go through it, but you'll see. All your Lightroom stuff, Photoshop, <coughs> um, at least half a dozen features in your cameras, all powered by AI. Some of them more so than others. For basic AI, what we have is machine learning. And what we do is basically it extracts patterns, right? It extracts the fact that if you're looking at, at lots of humans, they're all about certain height, they're all about certain shape, and there's this round thing on, on the top, and on top is, is something that's like hair with some variation, but not too much variation. It extracts all of those features. <clears throat> and it says that if you look at all these um, um, faces, all these people, that it's going to see certain types of eyes, say, more frequently than others on human beings. All right? In some cases, may never see an eagle's eye on a human being. <clears throat> so from that, it, it comes up with a statistical um, inference, which is basically, when I've got this kind of shape, this kind of head, I'm, going to, I'm more likely to see this kind of eye than I am to see a cat's eye, dog's eye, lion's eye, eagle's eye. All right? So that's what they call the probability of co-occurrence. That's machine learning. <clears throat> so this is what they do. They extract your features because computers work only with ones and zeros. All right? We have to keep remembering that all the time. So whatever we see in, a, in our complex world has to be reduced to these basic atomic elements. That's what they call embedding or tokenization. Right? So they break things up into little bits. That's what embedding means. That's what tokenization means. 
They break it up into little bits that this poor old computer can handle because they're a bit thick. They can think much faster than us, but they are a bit thick. Actually, not that thick because these new ones, they work with a complex... Anyone know about matrices? Did your matrix multiplication in, in school? These work with tensors and they have 1,536 dimensions. That's a heck of a lot of computing that's needed. Um, and what they do, that's what gives them their power. Right? Because they're actually looking at 1,500 different elements at the same time. Now we'll go through this basically we know that they, go, they, they need vast um, data sets and that they learn from it and that they refine, and we'll come back come to that in the next slide, they refine the processes <coughs> and what we get is what they call strong AI. It's not yet GAI, Generalized Artificial Intelligence, not yet, um, but it's getting there. But it's a, it's, a big, um, it's, a, it's a big barrier to get through. So the key thing is huge amounts of computing power. Right? Just one um, server is, costs around $700,000 per day just for electricity. This is the OpenAI server that we know about. <coughs> so the big mysterious thing is how do they generate images. Yeah, isn't that the mysterious thing? It's magical actually in some ways. Don't worry about the details. The generative adversarial network, remember I said we have to think about how the way we we think and we learn. Well suppose you're teaching a kid to draw a picture of a cat and your, your granddaughter draws something with a head and a beak and you say no that's not a cat that's a bird. Right, and it draws something else with kind of a big snout and, and three ears. And it says, no, no, it's got two ears and the cat's got a rounder face. That's actually closer to a dog. What are we doing? We're actually going through a generative adversarial network. Your granddaughter is generating a picture and you, and she's trying to say, look, look, Gran, this is a cat. And you say, no, 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 it's not, it's something else. So this is a network that's going around where um, your, child, your grandchild offers you this picture, you, re you, you reject it, comment on it, it comes up with another one, and it goes round and round until Gran, Gan, is happy with the result. Okay? That's one way of working. Does that make sense? <clears throat> so basically you need, uh, the generator doesn't know what you want, but the discriminator does. Right? And the discriminator uses real data, compares it with what the generator produces. If it sees that it's different, then it rejects it. Right? So that's the adversarial element. Um, this is slightly different, but it's the same kind of idea. And the analogy I, um, which, is, which I offer actually is in the papers as well, is you imagine it's a really foggy day and the fog is clearing. And then as it clears, you start to see shapes. And you start to see, well, is that a car or is that a person? And then as the fog clears, you start to see that Actually, that's a Morris Minor, or that's a Toyota. And as it gets clearer and clearer, you start to be able to read the uh, license plate. All right? So you're getting more and more detail as the fog clears. The fog clearing is basically you're reducing the noise. All right? But it reduces in a particular way, which um, reveals these patterns. <clears throat> and there's a certain amount of adversarial um, comparison going on as well. All right, I won't go into that, don't worry. Um, but basically, um, 
models such as Dali work mostly this way and they use some of that. Models such as stable diffusion and what's the other one? Mid journey. <coughs> they use primarily uh, di this diffusion model. Right? So it's not that, that um, it's not that mysterious, but you have to understand that it takes a great deal of computing to do all of those, all that fancy footwork. About seven or eight iterations are needed to produce an image. And if anyone's used any of this um, online, you'll see that actually they, they can churn out the, the result in, in half a second, four or five seconds. All right. Bearing in mind that 200,000 other people are on that computer um, asking for other images. So this is the kind of thing you can get. You'll see at the core of this image, um, my picture, you recognize that. <coughs> and those are the other elements which I asked AI to generate. So, and it's given me lots. I mean, I've got thousands of those different generations. I'll just go through these quite quickly. So, so there are elements here which are, that's another picture of mine in the center and then these other elements have been added. <coughs> um, and the point is that, one of the points I want to make is that the process has changed from curation, sorry, from Creation to curation, tripped over my own. Uh, from creation to curation. And in many ways, that's, that's, that's what happened with digital photography. As wedding photographers, we would come back with maybe 20, 30 rolls and think that was actually quite a heavy shoot. Right? Now, these boys and girls are coming back with 5,000 pictures on their their Canons and their Sonys, right? What are, what are we doing? We're changing the process from creation to curation. Out of the 5,000 pictures, they only need 20, 30 pictures for their clients. They only want to, put, to show 20, 30 pictures, right? That's a, that's a curatorial job. That's not creation. Of course, there's a lot of creation in the going click, click, click. <clears throat> but even that, I mean, if you're using autofocus and you're using um, minimum um, depth of field and you're 50 at 1.4 and, you know, it's, it's basically grab what you can and then see what you've got, isn't it? It's a different style of shooting, it's a different kind of, of creating. Uh, and with AI, you get these guys, they're saying, they sit on a computer and they generate tens of thousands. It's not even the thousands that I produce are nothing to what these boys produce. It becomes a curatorial exercise. There's a famous case called the Kushner Nova case um, with the US Copyright Office, where she talks about generating like 10,000 images just for one frame of her graphic novel. That's not creation, that's curation. Now, there's nothing wrong with curation. <laughs> it's a very important part of what we do. Um, but I, I'm inclined to say, well, let's be honest about exactly how and what we do. Um, so, this is another series. I've created um, NFTs out of this where it's a, um, I've mishmashed three or four different images. So this is a, this is a sequence where I've, I've uh, asked AI to produce images that represent, uh, in this case, I think it's Ravel, the music of Ravel. And it's quite interesting that, you see, all the all the um, AIs that you've seen will have like mythical creatures and, won't they, and dragons and 
castles and the sky and all that kind of thing. Well, I thought, this is boring. So I've, what I've been working on is actually giving these images, giving the AI models things like nonsense poetry, uh, Jabberwocky. Jabberwocky is great. Um, giving it um, poetry like from Emily Dickinson, from Dante, <coughs> from Shakespeare, um, and giving it abstract concepts like music of Mussorgsky, music of Ravel, and blow me down if they aren't actually all different. All right? if, you ask music, if you ask for um, expression of, of uh, Tchaikovsky's music, it's kind of all swirly and everything. <laughs> <clears throat> really interesting. I mean, the correspondence isn't like exact, isn't one-to-one, -one, but that's what I'm finding interesting about AI, about working with these models, uh, is that they, they, this machine, is given some words, it's got a job to do, and it clearly rummages around 16 billion data points, thinking, what the heck am I going to do with this? <laughs> but it's, it's got to produce something, so it does. And, it gets, and what it does is it learns from my feedback. All right, I'll give it a thumbs down, or I might give it a thumbs up, and I know it's gone back to the server, and it has altered what they call the waiting, or the waitings. Um, for those parameters, for those tensors. Um, so, you know, so for me, it's 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 a it's a different kind of tool. I'm not I'm not trying. I'm not interested in using it to to uh, produce photoreal images. That's a, that's another field. I'm not saying it's good or bad. This is what I'm interested in. This is what I find exciting. When you uh, terms like acemic. Anyone know about acemic art? No? Acemic art is where basically you use letter forms which don't necessarily mean anything, but you use letter forms as your elements in, in your artwork. Well, you get these boys to, boys, you get these machines to, um, and, and, if, and so I want something acemic, you know, with uh, Ar Arabic acemic calligraphy. It's quite different from uh, what it produces is different from if I ask for a semic Spencerian calligraphy. Knows the difference. So, you know, and what it produces is fun. It's amazing. I think it's amazing. This is just straight off. When I've asked for something like a semic um, art using um, color abstraction um, on parchment uh, with medieval calligraphy. And this is, um, I think it's a line from Dante, I can't remember what it is. Um, and uh, it, it, it has, gives it different results if you use Italian or if you use um, English. Um, so it's kind of just, you know, it's, I'm enjoying playing with it. Um, now this particular one is actually uses a basic image from Dali, and then it's been extended using other software, um, Photo in this case. So you see the trees and elements there which didn't come from the original Dali picture. Yeah, you can't ignore it. Whether you say it's art or not depends on where you come from in terms of what art is about. And I can understand people who say that's not art. Um, but, you know, I, I, I've, I've entered into some of these, these um, debates with, with people. And they're not particularly clear about what art is themselves. But I think one of the... Uh, one of the key points for, for many, pe uh, many people is that actually art involves actual human intervention, human action. They're actually talking a lot more about crafts, right? And yeah, we c I can't, can't make a 
you know, a cabinet with nice slidey drawers um, using AI. Um, but you can make images like this. And I'm very careful to always say this is produced by AI or it's produced by a, um, a, my, my, my combining different images using uh, image manipulation software. Uh, I'm not particularly, I've never been keen on, on calling something art or, or not. Actually, I've not even been that keen about calling my work photography. It's, you just take it as it is, you know, and if you don't like it, well, you can, you can, the door's over there. That the curation, yeah, the picture editing is as much of a skill as, as the actual photography. The number of times when I've been marking work produced at university, gone through the contact sheets and compared what was on the contact sheets with what was produced for the final project and think, what, what are you doing? You know, didn't anybody help you with um, picture selection? All right? <clears throat> um, and because I've been a picture editor, I've been in situations where I've had to make a decision on a whole, whole desk full of transparencies or with my books or whatever. Um, it's, like, it's like any, any other skill. Um, you get to a point where you know that if, there's, if, there's, if it's doubt, it's out. It's as simple as that. So if you produce 10,000 pictures and there's doubt about all of them, well, you chuck the whole bloody lot out. It's as simple as that. That's, so picture editing is really, really simple. Doubt about what? About the picture. Is it, is it good enough? Out. Is it, does it do it? Out. You know, um, I've, I've over, when people ask me about how we go through been through these competitions where you have to judge like 1,500 pictures a day <clears throat> or more, um, how you do it. Um, and my pat answer is you've got to fall in love, right? It's like walking um, down a high street, down a London road or whatever, whatever and you pass 5,000 people, but one person catches your eye, right? You're so beautiful. So in that way, it's, just, it's, it's quite simple. Very subjective, though, is it? isn't, you know. Um, I don't want to go dive, dive too much into that, but what I found from my, um, my time working on big inter uh, ex um, international competitions and also teaching at university, if a piece of work is outstanding, there's no argument. It's only the in-betweenies where you get an argument, All right? And, you know, in our business, we're actually only interested in the outstandings. In university, yeah, you've got to reward people who've tried hard and, you know, but aren't, don't quite make it or they've had problems at home or whatever, so you kind of make adjustments, all that kind of thing. That's where all the arguments come. Is this good enough for, for a 2-1 or is it doesn't make, quite make it? The first-rate work is first-rate work. It goes through like that. And it's the same with competitions. We've, I've been in these competitions where we've had tens of thousands of images to look at. Most of the time, uh, the, and not always, yeah. Most of the time, the outstanding work is outstanding. It's simple. Yeah. So to that extent, it's not subjective. But I think one, one of the, the, probably the key point for all of this is the extent to which a definition separates out um, certain practices, certain people from others. All right? So, for example, in the, in the art business, it's essential for them to maintain their definition of art as one which justifies huge prices and 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 their royalties and everything else right? for others art is a notion that gives them a warm cuddly dopamine fueled feeling about what they're doing 
And all of that is, has, has its value. And I think that's why this, this whole notion of art is it's not something to, to, to pin down, because basically art is a cultural activity to which we have whole different values, right? <clears throat> which is why I'm personally n never engaged into that kind of discussion. Um, but um, before we go too far, um, I was asked to remember, remember what is this? I was asked to talk about the future of creativity. And this is all actually quite relevant. Because I was thinking about it, and I was thinking actually, because I've been working on the whole, uh, on, on the whole idea of creativity for many years. And what I came to is that basically, um, we have operating, we work in a world of three layers of creativity. So my layer one is where most of stuff, what we do happens, right? Um, pretty much all the work that's here, all the work that we do, all the work that I do, is pretty much in layer one. Meaning that we combine and recombine known elements, known experience, known knowledge, in different ways whether it's a recipe or whether it's a sunset or a portrait, that's layer one. Most of AI is operating at layer one. Layer two is where, we, where the excellence starts to happen, where people combine and recombine things in ways which are still basically consistent with the patterns that exist, but they do it in more refined ways. They do it in ways which do not disrupt. I don't want to use too much of a negative uh, definition, but actually they're not too disruptive, right? So our top chefs are like that. Our top bakery chefs are like that. Our top um, photographers are like that, right? We recognize layer two photography. That's what we give prizes for, but they don't disrupt. And one could almost say that if they did dis disrupt, they probably wouldn't be even considered for prize. Okay? Then this is where we get to layer three. That's where the creativity is not only disruptive, but it pulls people behind along with them. All right, so we're talking about impressionists and abstract art. Well, there's a huge foray, as we know, about impressionism and then abstract art. But these guys totally disrupted the art world and then they pulled everyone with them. All right. And to a certain extent, what we've got with AI has that potential. And that, for me, is at the heart of what people are really worried about. They're not actually really worried about their jobs. They're really worried that those who use AI could, they're, they're worried about that those who use AI may be given a leg up to layer three creativity. You get that? And it's already happening in maths. All right? There's a problem called matrix multiplication where basically you have an algorithm um, to, mul to multiply matrices. Um, and a basic uh, multiplication, however many rows and columns you have, you need a cube of that number of uh, separate multiplications to get the results. If you can reduce that, you, in huge, you increase computability. Well, somebody managed to figure it out in his head, very clever little German mathematician. But then they said, all right, well, let's ask, ask AI to do this job. Well, blow me down if AI didn't manage to come up with a better algorithm, all right? Which, it only reduced it by, by one extra step, but when you've got 1,536 axes, that one extra step, uh, it hugely increases um, the efficiency of the computability. That could not have been done by a human being. You know why? Because the number of iterations that it had to go through to figure out 
was apparently more than all the atoms in the universe. But it figured it out. Okay? So that's your layer three. It's disruptive, but you have to follow it. All right? It's like modern music, it's like Stravinsky, bloody disruptive, but actually everybody said, actually, I can't. You know, music's not the same after Stravinsky's Rite of Spring. Yeah? <clears throat> so that's your... So that's where our future of um, creativity, creativity may be going. That AI definitely helps people achieve, like, layer two creativity. And that, for me, is, is that. Right? It, it, when I work with it long enough, when I, when I kick it and nudge it and, and do stuff, and, you know, and the little things you have to learn, like for example, if you go down a particular path and you just tweak one or two words in the prompt, uh, the machine actually, the, the AI seems to get bored. And after a while, it produces crap. So you either have to start a new thread, you have to log out, log in again to make sure you use a different part of this ruddy thing and then start again. Right? So you have to learn all these little things. Um, but when it works, it surprises me. It's dis it disrupts what I thought I was working for. I thought I wanted a certain result, but it said, look at this. And you look at it and you think, blow me down. I like this. Yeah. <laughs> is that because now we're coming into touch with something that's non-human? I mean, it's built, still built on training models which are from the human world. But, um, so that perspective maybe could not have been provided with a human. Yeah, intelligence. yeah, because I think it's been learning from me. You know, there are times when I definitely get the sense, in the early days, now there are so many people on, on, on uh, working on it. Um, and, you know, I, I should add full disclosure, I'm, I'm on the DALI kind of artist support program or whatever, um, so I don't actually have to pay for all of these things, thank God. Um, <coughs> but, um, what I was going to say, that, uh, where were we? We were talking about the fact it's dependent on... Uh, yeah, yeah, models. it's learning from you. Yeah. I mean, even, even in Photoshop, just the basic AI that you've got in Photoshop, it learns from you. Yeah. You know, it learns what you want to do, and then starts giving you what you want to do. Yeah, yeah. Because um, one, one of the... One of, a, a kind of general point that's um, worth making with regard to AI is that I say that um, it, um, it's highly retentive, all right? it's, it's sealed in that you can teach it 15 billion things and it'll remember it. Uh, and more importantly, it can pass all of that to another computer within you know, a few minutes. But it's not porous. All right? Whereas we are really crap at retain, retaining things, but we're extremely porous. Or we can be. And I, I think uh, this is another whole part of, of like art practice, is how porous people are to new influences and to new ideas. I was trying to show that I'm porous because I realized that actually there are ways of photographing which I was never, <laughs> never taught, I was actually taught never to do, <clears throat> like photograph without framing. <clears throat> um, so, but these machines are now becoming porous. They're now learning stuff and changing the way they do things. One of the things I think that you commented on about with AI, you'll get a certain number of iterations and then it will turn to crap. And that reminds me of things like social media or Netflix. You know, Netflix, it keeps showing you the same crap over and over and over again. Then you end up using a new account and we log it to break it up. One of the things I see happening with my dabbling in AI is it starts to form another box. Like we learned to be uh, photographers or artists by seven books. 
and you get to a certain point with AI where it starts to impose its own rules on what it thinks it wants you to see to keep you happy. You know, like with social media or, 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 or streaming TV, it's about keeping you engaged on the platform by keeping you happy, not being creative. And so, as mm. you do, you know, I log out, leave a couple of days, come back, come back in. And I've even um, on to my third, um, third account, I have literally scrapped accounts. It's interesting. It's good, better, and different, but I want that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I'll I, I come to you, yeah, yeah. Can you discuss copyright or not copyright of what I understand? <laughs> okay, all right, um, yeah, I'll, I'll just see what your question is. Oh, it was just the, the fact that, are you finding that you're not reaching this level three as well, the excellence, like you say, it's sort of got to like level two, and you can kind of see that in that, it's not quite there, is it, as the most outstanding piece? I, uh, yeah, I, yeah. Um, I, I just answered that, and then, I, and then there's this question about copyright, which is quite a big, big issue. <clears throat> um, I think the thing about level three um, is that it could well be that it's essentially a human, human level. <clears throat> it takes it takes a Picasso, it takes a Stravinsky, it takes a, a Corbusier or something to to kind of look at the whole thing and say, no, 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 we should shake it up. We'll do it differently. You know, it takes a hundred vasa to say, no, we're not going to do it this way. <clears throat> you can see that with these large language models, they actually can't do that. They can't say, fuck it, I'm going to do it this way. Right, because they're trained. That's how they're trained. Because they are machines who will, that will do only what they have been told to do. But <clears throat> I think using these tools may well help the musicians, the writers, whatever, to achieve more than they could have by themselves. Whether it's a good thing or a bad thing is, is, is up to open. I, I, I think it's immensely exciting. Yeah, it's just going to make you go further. Yeah, yeah. And this example of the maths is, is, is a good example of where something quite straightforward, they knew there was a problem, they didn't know how to figure it out, so they asked the machine. Right? It took like two weeks of computing, I mean that's a lot of computing, um, but it came out with an answer where all the mathematicians have said, hell yes, this is the way to do it. <clears throat> yeah. Now, of course, as many of you know, so much of what we're talking about is built on stuff that has been scraped, dredged, collected, piled up uh, and, uh, and processed, all right? Uh, they call it tokenization, embedding. <coughs> uh, let me go back. That. <coughs> I'm not an expert on, because I haven't looked at it, on what it does with text or with music. But I have looked uh, closely at, what, at how it gets to pictures. <coughs> it's, a, it's a fundamental um, misunderstanding that these large language models actually hold databases of images. All right, say that again. <clears throat> um, it's a big misunderstanding that these large language models hold databases of images. They don't, they can't. Anybody who knows anything about computing knows that that's a totally mad way to do it. You don't do it that way. What you do is you look for features. <clears throat> So they stored features, they stored elements of stuff. So for example, if you ask, <coughs> no, all right, um, and that's based on looking at lots of pictures and then extracting information from it. So what it knows is based on what it's been taught. So for example, if you ask for 
picture of a tabby cat. It can give you a really detailed picture of tabby cats. Right? But if you ask for a picture of a, uh, what's it, Devon Rex, it hasn't been taught many pictures of Devon Rexes, so they all look the same. Right? That shows that they haven't stored pictures of tabby cats and Devon Rexes, it's just stored different elements of their um, features, and those are listed as co-occurrences of terms such as Devon Rex or Tevi Cat. So there are thousands of co-occurrences of all these different um, uh, features with Tevi Cats, and not so many of Devon Rexes. Right? So it's stored only these, these features. And there's another reason for that. If you, um, when, they, when they learn these data sets, some people seem to think that they're given like large files for these data sets to, to look at. Well, it's nonsense. The file's only about 214 pixels square. We would regard them as really low resolution. Right? And they are. Because, why? Because they're not interested in a picture, they're interested in the features. It's all about feature extraction. Yeah? You've got an army of people in places like India and China who, have, who are going through these pictures and marking them. Yeah, this is an eye, this is a left. Yeah. This, that's, been that, um, yeah. It hasn't happened automatically. Yeah, yeah, it doesn't happen automatically. Um, it comes a little bit, maybe comes from any metadata and any captioning, but yes, the rest of it is about labeling. All right, and as you say, there are armies of people in all over the world paying peanuts to do this kind of, um, to do this kind of job. So, uh, so just on this copyright thing, <clears throat> it's significant that two cases have gone to, to court the judge has struck out the direct copyright claim, saying that it was not proven. And it's because they couldn't show that they had a picture, their own picture, and the uh, model had produced a picture that was identical or very similar to it. Because it can't. Now, in terms of style, what happens is that... Um, in the labeling and in the captioning, I mean, if, for example, you did a Google search of pictures in the style of Cartier-Bresson, you get all these different kinds of black and white pictures, yes? Some will be Cartier-Bresson, some will not. I've done this research myself. <clears throat> um, so when the, when the pictures are tokenized, so the pictures are extracted, so they know, for example, that Basically, it's, these pictures are outdoors, these are people, they have streets, and they're like Parisian streets, whatever. And if you ask for the style of Cartier-Bresson, you'll see that in many instances, when it extracted pictures of streets, of Paris, or whatever, that the name Cartier-Bresson occurred with it. So it knows that to prefer pictures with those associations in building up, in generating your image. So when it comes across, say, coloured pictures, but there's no association with Cartier-Bresson, then it will just reject it. Right? If it comes to another picture, it's a black and white picture, and it's associated with Cortege, then it will reject that. Right? Until it finds a picture that has some association with Cartier-Bresson, then it will use that to build the image. That's how it builds style. Yeah? Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. So <clears throat> I think it's still open the extent to which um, having these pictures come through the computer and then out again and be used in, in the whatever ways they are used. The open question is whether, actually, as a, as a matter of governance of policy, these big companies should have put aside some money and say, all right, well, let's, let's create some kind of fund or something to keep these guys sweet. 
If I had been on the governance, I, that's what I would have said. I would have said, you keep, keep aside like 0.5% of the money you're getting from Microsoft. That's still 500 million. Um, and, um, you know, and then give it to some artist fund and say, see, we acknowledge that this is built on the work of artists and we want to give back. They would have diffused so much because it's impossible, totally impossible, to say, well, there are, there's this percentage from Cartier-Bresson and there is, you know, 0.0002% of Gale Sten. So how are you going to divvy up who gets paid? Because it's impossible to tell whether, say, an underwater picture of someone um, is, has, has Gale Stent elements in it or whether it's someone else's. Impossible. Right? Because of the way it's been tokenized. Well, it will come up with an underwater picture of someone underwater with flowy clothes or whatever. In that situation, could Gail not say, but look, in your search, or that search would go on? Yeah, yeah. But you see, that's exactly the case that these photographers and artists were making um, in the court case. I can't remember their, their names. Uh, and the judge said, all right, well, fair enough, but which of your picture is this a copy of? Well, it looks like my pictures. It's in my style. And the judge will say, well, as you know, style is not protected under copyright. And if this is not a copy of your picture, then what are you complaining about? You have no grounds for a claim. There's, the <clears throat> that there's lots to, to debate on that. And it was, it was also an issue of uh, digital uh, photographs as well, which is why filters that recreate um, film grain um, are also so popular. Yeah. Uh, but all right, last, last two then. Yeah. Um, what AI programs do you do? Do you do a mix of the gray stabilized, um, uh, what is it, Yeah. Dali? Yeah. I use, I use all the ones which I can get away which are free. So, um, no, I pay for photo. Um, DALI, um, Leonardo AI, which is basically stable diffusion. Uh, Night Cafe, which I think is also stable diffusion. They give me five credits every day, so. <laughs> so I accumulate and then I'll, I'll have a run. Yeah, 1,500 customized models now because you can download these models and train them on your, on, on your own data sets. Hardly anything online is safe these days. <laughs> no. So, yeah, I, 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 would, I would just be careful what, what I put on, just as you found. Yeah. So, um, so I'm afraid with the last question, because I've been told a bit of wind up. Uh, I just feel that there's a need to uh, define things a little better. Uh, right. I didn't put my hand up when you asked if I'd used AI. If I use this, if I use my icon. Um, what, we, what I'm getting, I get the image, it enhances it if I do a JPEG yeah. or if I use this. Yeah. It's an enhancement. Whereas AI, where you just a few words, that is something radically different. So yeah. I wouldn't call that AI. I don't uh, know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I call it an enhancement. Or yeah, a well, it's, it's, I, I gave you the three definitions of, of, of weak through to strong AI. Yeah, so. Well, so so I, I did I did cover that. Thank you very much.